When searching for a commencement speaker, I turned to my mom. As always, her choice is brilliant and set in the context of a mother's love and an appreciation of accomplishment. One of the reasons Mark Muriel, the president of the National Urban League, is a great choice for our speaker is because his mother, Sybil Muriel, who's with us today, was a teacher as well as a bridesmaid in my mother's wedding. As I told the seniors early this morning at the robing ceremonies, the friends you have made at BU will be with you forever. Mr. Moriel took his mother's love and raising and put it to good use. He was born in 1958. He's an American political and civic leader. He has served as mayor of the New Orleans, Louisiana from 1994 to 2002, a position his father held from 1978 to 1986. He is currently the president of the National Urban League, which is the oldest and largest community-based organization of its kind in the nation. It is dedicated, as we are, to creating a society that is equitable, honors diversity, and is welcoming and affirming to all. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Moriel to share his wisdom with us. Thank you very much. Good morning. Uh, first to uh, Dean Coleman and all of the administrators at the Boston University School of Education, uh, to the faculty uh, and staff, also to all of the parents and family graduates. Let's give the parents, grandparents, and your family a big round of applause. And thank them so very much. for all that they do. Now, yesterday, I was a New York Yankees fan. Today, I am a Boston Red Sox fan. Tomorrow, well, <laughs> yesterday, I was a New Orleans Saints fan. Today, I'm a New England Patriots fan but I will not pull your leg tomorrow. I'll be a New Orleans Saints fan. <laughs> Yesterday, I was a Boston University Terrier hockey fan. Today, I'm a Boston University Terrier hockey fan. Tomorrow, I'll be a Boston University. Let me take this opportunity to thank you for honoring me by giving me a chance to share some thoughts with you on this, your very special day. Let me underscore what Dean Coleman said. It's special for me because my mother attended and graduated from Boston University in 1952. And also again in 1955 when she received a master's degree. And throughout my life, I heard so much about this great school. But I also learned of my mother's treks from the South, when she would ride a segregated rail car from New Orleans to Washington, transfer from that segregated rail car to an integrated rail car, and come here to Boston University in the early 1950s, when she had the great pride and opportunity to be a schoolmate of the great Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. I'm also proud to be here today because your dean, Hardin Coleman, and I share some very important roots. You see, his father and mother are quite distinguished, great Americans, pioneers, and leaders. But his grandfather, Dr. Joseph Hardin, was a legendary figure in early 20th century New Orleans. It was on a playground named after his grandfather that I learned to play basketball. His grandfather's name graced a great school in New Orleans. So Hardin Coleman's roots and Hardin Coleman's destiny was preordained generations ago. Let's thank your dean. Let's congratulate him.
and the last point of personal privilege is to recognize his wonderful parents, his great father, William T. Coleman, a legendary figure and a role model for every young lawyer uh, growing up in the 1970s and the 1980s, and his wonderful mother, who was uh, a mentor of my mother back in New Orleans uh, in those days in the mid-20th century. So I want to ask you, I want to let you know how proud I am uh, to be here today. I want to share with you very quickly a few thoughts as I charge you. I charge you to go forth from this ceremony today. Yes, as great educators. Yes, as people committed to the children and the next generation. But I want to charge you to take the next step, and that is to leave here as leaders. As leaders for what this nation needs in these great times of challenge for our 21st century future. It is often said, and I've heard presidents and business leaders, I've heard people from all walks of life say that education is the civil rights issue of our time, and that it is. But I think we must say something more than that, and that is that education is a right in this nation not a privilege, not a choice, not an option, but that education is a right and a moral imperative in 21st century America. It is not. It is not a coincidence that in the early days of the 20th century, into the 30s and into the 1940s, the late, great, and legendary Charles Hamilton Houston, along with Thurgood Marshall and a generation of lawyers, chose to attack the system of segregation in this nation with an attack on access to education. First, on access to higher education, and later, on access to elementary and secondary education. Like their battles then, our battles now for the future of this nation must center on improving access, closing the achievement gap, and doing those things necessary for 21st century America. A few thoughts on that. First of all, we must embrace the idea, if we are going to close the achievement gap, and I encourage you to be leaders on this issue, that we must stand firm and strong for adequate and equitable funding for education at every single level, from early childhood to elementary and secondary education to higher education. We must not shirk our responsibility to say that the more we intelligently invest, the higher return we will get as a nation. It's a tragedy that in too many states and in too many counties, what we spend per pupil on education depends on race, geography, national origin, where you live, where your school is indeed located. You must embrace the idea that this nation must say that funding for education must, both, 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 uh, must, also, must be both adequate and equitable in the 21st century. Second, I urge you to be leaders in recognizing that the great system of public education created in the early 20th century worked then but is not sufficient for now. We must have robust early childhood education for every child in this nation. It is a moral imperative. We must, we must, we must recognize that if education is the civil rights issue of our time, that longer school days, longer school years, more time on task, integration of music, arts, and other aspects of education must be a part of every child's upbringing, not just for the privileged few. And I urge you 
to be leaders on this issue. Second, I urge you to lend your voices as a part of the chorus that says, we must honor and respect educators. There's too much in this nation today that wants to demonize teachers. And we have a history in this country of demonization. We've demonized lawyers. We demonize elected officials. There's all too often an instinct that we have that seeks to place the tail on the donkey to blame a profession when somehow our expectations are not met. Your voices, now as you go forth from this hall today, as professional educators, must be that your profession is one to be honored, one to be respected, and one to be properly compensated if it is valued in the way we must value it in the 21st century. We must build. We must build in this nation a comprehensive system to both prevent children from dropping out of school, but secondarily to provide a pathway for those children who for some reason do not make it in the traditional system of education. What we do today, well-intentioned, is too ad hoc, not coherently designed, your generation of educators must take this challenge by the hands to recognize that in this nation today, uh, we have many 20 and 30 year olds who want to learn, who want to be educated, who maybe for some reason took the wrong step, didn't finish high school on time. We must embrace them because to the extent that we provide opportunities for them to enhance their skills, our nation's economy is better off. Next, we must make college affordable for all. When I, the parents in this hall, many have sacrificed greatly for each of you to be educated. I'm sure a large number of you are walking away having signed these promissory notes to help pay your tuition. When I finished Georgetown University Law School in 1983, I finished $25,000 in debt, and phew, I thought that was a lot. I'm shocked that today's students, many of them, leave college and graduate school with many times more debt than that. We must tackle this. We must tackle this challenge and we must tackle it because we must reject what I call the conversation of mass deception. And the conversation of mass deception says that we cannot afford to make college more affordable. We cannot afford to provide early childhood education for all. We cannot afford to provide adequate and equitable funding for schools in this nation. I say that a nation that has spent a trillion dollars in the last decade on wars abroad can muster the will to place emphasis on education in the next decade. Your voices. Your voices must be strong and resolute on this very point. We face today a nation of changing demography. We face a nation where just this week, uh, USA Today reported that, and many leading newspapers reported, a fact that's been self-evident for a long time, that now births by children of color equal births of children who are white. It points to the workforce and the future of this nation. We can ill afford at this time to turn our back on the need to invest in education. We can ill afford at this time of great crisis the need to place increased emphasis on educating our children. And we must reject the weapons of mass 
deception which seek to say that we cannot afford it. It is, I think, at the end, a question of what is our priority. What is the priority for the future of this nation? If the priority is economic competitiveness, then we invest in education. If the priority is life, liberty, and happiness for all, then we invest in education. If the priority is a strong American nation in the middle of the 21st century, then we must invest in education. I say to you, the 20,012 graduates of the School of Education at Boston University, that your charge is not just to know this. Your charge is not to just agree with this or to understand it. Your charge is to go forth and be leaders, leaders on this, to become leaders in this nation who lend your voice to the need to create new priority for, indeed, our next generation. Education is the civil rights issue of our time. But education is more than that. Education has to become, we must understand it in our heart and our soul as an inalienable right of survival in the 21st century. John F. Kennedy, when he counseled us a long time ago, that great Bostonian, he counseled us that the idea of putting a man on the moon and returning him safely to Earth by 1970 was something that the United States must do, not because it was easy, but because it was hard. I say today that turning the corner and elevating education to an inalienable right, uh, to ensuring that there's adequate and equitable funding, to ensuring that there's early childhood education, to challenging the weapons of mass deception would have us believe that we cannot do it, is work that is not going to be easy, but work that is indeed very hard. I hope that by virtue of your education here at Boston University, you are empowered. I hope that by your work here at Boston University, you are inspired. And I hope that by your work and your accomplishments, and the degrees that you earn today at Boston University, you are prepared to lead this fight. Go forth, go on. Our nation needs you. You are prepared and you are ready. God bless you. Congratulations. I thank you.